Hey everybody, it's Gauntletx, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing another premiere draft of the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Without further ado, let's get into our pack one pick one. Not a super exciting pack to me, none of these commons are super premium cards that I love to take super highly, and the uncommons are all also a bit narrow. Green, white, gold card, a black defensive board wipe, a uh, really dirtily little stun effect, and then the cave build around. And in my opinion, kind of the weakest cave build around because it really requires you to have your caves in the early game. So that makes it super, super, super narrow. You have to draw super well with this to get that cave value really going. But our rare is okay. I still wouldn't call this a premium rare either. I think there's just a really weak pack overall. Queen's Bay Paladin is a solid rare. There's not a million vampires in the format, but there are enough that a 5 mana 5 for that reanimates a vampire at the cost of a few points of life is still a fine card. So I'll take the Queen's Bay Paladin here. And this is going to be a hard choice pack one pick two because this pack is actually phenomenal. There's a Kabarakti Sunborn, which is one of the kind of mythic tier uncommons in the format, because it is not hard to have an extra treasure token and a 1-1 sitting on your board or any combination of spells like that to tap two cards and discover three with this every time it attacks, and that is tremendous value. That's consistently drawing you a non-land card every time and casting it for free. This card is completely busted, and probably the best card well it's definitely the best card in the pack and probably what we should choose but there is the option of taking a second queen's bay paladin just to be firmly on that vampire path and to have some real consistency for that kind of strategy don't think i'm gonna do it i haven't had a ton of great experiences with black white as a color pair and with a lot of vampires in the format I think a lot of them are pretty weak. The best one really just being Glorifier of Suffering. So I think Queen's Bay Paladin is just a weaker build around than the Sunborn. I mean, this card, you don't even really have to build around it that much because uh, there's so many ways to easily, easily trigger its attack ability. So we'll go with the Sunborn there. And for pick three, we don't really see a good follow-up to either of our first picks. There's no great red or white cards that spit out multiple cards on the board, and there's no black or white vampires. There's actually just no white card at all. So this is not a great sign for how things are going. We could take the Dinotomaton, which is a super solid 4-drop for any red deck, a menace threat that gives another creature menace when you play it. So that's perfectly reasonable. Could take the uh, Conservator because it fits into anything just fine. Yeah. Not a great follow-up here. I mean, my favorite card's probably Iceberg, but not by a ton. I mean, Dinotomaton's pretty close, so I'll just take that. All right, pack one, pick four. Now we see some great stuff. We've got a Mediocre Vampire to go with the Queen's Bay Paladin, or an excellent Ultec Cloud Guard, spitting out two cards to go with the Sunborn, or the big spooky Ceratops, for just being a standalone, really hard to block threat. I've had some great experiences with the Ceratops for sure as just a standalone threat, but I do really like how the Cloud Guard synergizes with the Sunborn, and it's a great spell by itself, getting you an evasive threat and a nice little blocker at the same time to play offense and defense. So I'm gonna take the Cloud Guard over the Ceratops, but big number two, big thumbs up to the Ceratops as well. I think that card has also been quite good. For pick five now, we've got a Petrify here for some fine, cheap, consistent removal in white. There's also an Idol of the Deep King, which is far from my favorite removal spell in red, but the one thing that this does do quite well as removal in red is it leaves behind a permanent. So that artifact permanent, whether it's flipped or unflipped, is another permanent you can tap towards your cards like the Sunborn. So it could be reasonable for that reason, but I still think Petrify is just the better removal spell and the second best card in the pack. So I'm going to take Petrify here. Best card being Thrashing Brontodon, but I'd like to be in the red-white direction with the Sunborn here. For pick six, we now have a Plundering Pirate, which is a premium, premium common here for getting two permanents off the one card. And the treasure token is really flexible and powerful as well. So I love me. A Plundering Pirate. We will scoop it up pretty easily. I think that's my favorite card in the pack. I like the Kin Collar a good amount in Dinosaur decks as well. 
but pretty low on the, the Curator of Sun's creation. You need a ton of Discover for that, and it's hard to get that much. Pick 7 now. Diamond Pickaxe should be pretty good for a Tapper kind of red-white deck. Gives you a lot of extra permanence to sit on the board. We could also take the Calamitous Cave in here and hope to wield a white cave card, and then we just start taking every single cave we see. That could be cute, but Pickaxe could definitely work out instead of a little bit of a gamble on the cave in here, so let's take the Diamond Pickaxe. And pick eight, there's now a Plundering Pirate versus a Rampaging Ceratops, which is a hard choice because, again, Pirate synergizes super well with our Sunborn, and it's just a great card up front. But that Ceratops is tempting. Yeah, I think I still go for the Pirate here. I think I go all in on the synergy for the Sunborn. And the one big flaw of the Ceratops is that it's just a big dork. It has no activated abilities, no triggered abilities, no passive abilities. So one for one removal does just completely deal with it. And that's one of the things that makes Plundering Pirate and the Cloud Guard cards like these so nice is that even if they just get immediately removal spelled, they still left something behind just by hitting the board for a moment. So there's that upside to the pirate as well. Now we'll take a rock slide fine filler removal here. Definitely makes the cut. Pick 10. Not a big fan of any of these. I already have three four mana creatures, so it's going to be hard to fit another Dynatomaton in here, especially when there are other really, really good four mana cards, like the Cloud Guard and the Sunborn, I think are both better than Dynatomaton, which is one of the big issues with the card. I think the card is good. The problem is that there are just really good at four mana cards, so it's kind of hard to fit it in to the deck every time. So we just take the Combat Trick, the Ancestor's Aid. Nothing great here. My favorite of these cards is the solid tempo play of the Waylaying Pirates to stun some stuff, so we'll take that. And pick 12, all right, we get a Rampaging Ceratops, don't mind if I do. I mean, Dowsing Device is pretty cute with a ton of treasure tokens, we could try to toy around with that, but I think I just take the uh, more consistent Ceratops. Pick 13, get an Idol of the Deep King, which hits the board and shoots something, leaving behind this permanent, which is nice. Burning Sun Cavalry, good in red-green when you're playing dinosaurs, and bad when you're not. And we're not going to be playing that many dinosaurs. We might have a couple, one Dinatomaton, one Ceratops, but I don't think we're going to be a good deck for the uh, the dino card. And back to pick one, we get super lucky with Anim Pakal, Thousandth Moon. One a red and a white for a 1-2. Whenever you attack with one or more non-gnome creatures... You put a plus one plus one counter on a neem and create X one ones tapped and attacking, where X is the number of plus one plus one counters on them. So, really excellent card. You don't even have to put her at risk by attacking with her as long as you're attacking with other non gnome creatures. And she's just going to spit out an entire army in a can, so I will happily take a neem pakal here. Pack 2, pick number 2 here. We have two really good options for this deck. There's the Guardian of the Great Door, which is going to be a super sick finisher. Pretty easy to cast this for cheap, because we're tapping untapped artifact tokens like treasures, and creatures like our Plundering Pirates, and maybe some gnome tokens that we get from cards like Cloud Guard. And then there's just the really good synergy piece of the Tinker's Tote. This puts out three permanents off the one spell, so it works incredibly well with cards like our Kaparakti Sunborn that's trying to tap untapped permanents we have, or cards like the Guardian. I think the Guardian is, because it's an uncommon, because it's a big finisher, it's the kind of thing we're not going to see as often. Um, so I'm going to take the Guardian here over the Tote, but actually a little bit of a hard choice there, because while we'll have less opportunities to pick up cards like Guardian of the Great Door, we don't need as many copies of them, whereas Tinker's Tote is the kind of card we could run a lot of copies of and be pretty happy. For pack 2, pick 3 now, we have the excellent value play of Spring-Loaded Sawblades. This is going to hit the board, clear out a tapped creature, and then just leave an artifact behind that we can tap for whatever purposes we want. Or we can turn it into a really easy-to-crew vehicle, a 5-5 five five that crews for only one, or you can just tap two artifacts you control to crew it. So, really, really nice card for this kind of deck. Definitely better than the Chomp. We do have a couple dinosaurs, but this is going to be um, significantly worse than Sawblade for this deck. Because uh, Sawblade has uh, has other synergies. And this is a very easy Old Tech Cloud Guard now. 
mainly competing with Sunfire Torch. I have actually been kind of impressed by this. I ended up with a traditional draft deck, I think it was, um, that had three copies of this thing as the main removal spells, and it was just getting extra damage in early uh, as an equipment, and then just whenever we needed to pop it as removal, we could do that. So I do like the Torch and Aggro decks, but Cloud Guard is just so perfect for the red-white archetype, and really any archetype in the format. Cloud Guard's just a great card. Pick five, now we've got a pretty sweet Dire Flail to play around with. One mana for an equipment that equips for only one to give plus two plus zero. That part's okay, it's fine in your more aggressive decks. The really exciting part, though, is if we manage to craft an artifact with this thing, flip it into the uh, the blunderbuss, then whenever our equipped creature attacks, we can like sacrifice a treasure token to have our equipped creature just shoot a blocker and kill it. So Dire Flail is a really nice card once you can get it flipped, and it shouldn't be that hard for this deck to do so. Pick six now, a Goblin Tomb Raider, great for a red-white aggro deck that has a lot of random ways to spit out artifacts like treasures and gnomes. Very happy to take Tomb Raider over the whirlpool here because this is not great removal for aggressive strategies since if we're trying to clear out a blocker or something that just has a good ability and isn't uh, attacking to become tapped then we're spending six mana on it which is a lot great for defensive decks though when you're just clearing out little attacking creatures but that's not what we want to do with our removal spells we are looking pretty aggressive here in red white for pick seven, we've got the really big expensive boulder, or we've got the little envoy of Okadaka Hao for another three drop. I don't think the envoy is really going to make the cut if we find just a couple more pirates, but I do already have one Ancestor's Aid, and we have some really good non-creature spells like Spring-Loaded Saw Blades, Dire Flail, Diamond Pickaxe type stuff, so I don't know how likely the aid is to make the cut either. I'll take the creature over it, take the envoy of Okadaka Hao. And we really do need some filler two drops at this point to where while I do like the Sunfire Torch in this deck, it also gives me something else to tap, which is awesome. I have enough filler non-creature spells if I don't get quality cards like Torch. I do not have enough filler creatures at one and two mana to have a decent aggressive curve. So we need to take something like the Volatile Wanderglyph here to fill out that two mana slot over the Sunfire Torch. And for pick nine, just more filler non-creature spells. We'll grab the family reunion, I guess, for the combat tricky thing, but it probably doesn't make the cut. Pick ten, we got the Tinker's Tote to come all the way back around. I don't think the Guardian of the Great Door would have done that, so very, very happy to see this Tinker's Tote. It will absolutely join the deck. And pick eleven at this point, even with two dinosaurs in the whole deck, Probably do just need a 2-mana 2-2 two two with no text with how our mana curve looks. So, join the party, Burning Sun Cavalry, and I will happily add a Sunfire Torch to the party. Pick 13, throw some nonsense to the sideboard. And just throw in a little bit more nonsense in the sideboard until we open up our third pack and see what sweet stuff we get to pull out of there. All right, pack three pick one is sadly basically a complete miss. We already have two Ancestors Aid, and they're already unlikely to make the cut. I'm not going to play a landmark. It's a little dirtily, a little slow for its cost. Curator of Sun's creation is very, very narrow. It's super, super unlikely to end up with enough to cover for it. We're definitely not in that position here. We're just a two-color deck. We don't need the Compass Gnome for fixing, so we're just taking a filler two-mana creature just because we need more two-mana creatures. So... Pretty sad pick for uh, for pick one here, but it is what it is. We'll grab a Thousand Moons Crack Shop. And now pack three, pick two. We've got another one drop creature, the Miner's Guidewing. I actually think this is pretty exciting for this deck because we've got a few awesome ways to buff up a little flyer like this. Not a ton, but like if we put a Dire Flail on that thing, that's massive, even if it's unflipped. And then we have a pickaxe and a torch that would be fine to put onto it. So I actually think just one mana, one one flying vigilance attackers, pretty solid. If this weren't in the pack, Wanderglyph and Scallywag would both be decent two mana options to fill out that two mana slot on curve. But I actually think I like the guide wing here with some equipment to toss onto it. Pack three, pick three. 
Atali's Favor has been kind of impressive in my more aggressive decks, and I've been hearing a lot of buzz about this in the limited community in general. And it does seem pretty solid. I mean, 3 mana for plus 1, plus 1 trample, and you immediately just draw and cast another card. So, basically you're just adding plus 1, plus 1 trample to whatever spell you're hitting. So if you're hitting like a 2 mana 2-2 two, two on average... You're playing a 3-mana 2-2 two, two that comes with plus 1, plus 1 trample to put on something, and I like throwing this onto the guide wing or something like that. I'm going to take Atali's Favor over another Petrify here or another Pickaxe. Play around with that. I have enjoyed it every time I've tried it out, uh, which I have done in a few other red aggressive decks, and I'm just kind of excited about the card right now with the buzz around it. Uh, pick 4, no 2-drop creatures. We've got a super filler, very low toughness 3-drop with the Hot Foot Gnome. Or we have the really filler 3 mana 3-3. Three, three. Either of these is probably going to get cut, but I think the Envoy might stick around, so we'll take that. Another Plundering Pirate would be awesome in this deck. The Gold Series Strider would be fine. We've got a lot of stuff to tap for it, but again, I like adding to the 1 and 2 drop slot, and the Sunshot Militia is actually a very good 2 drop to add to this deck, because we have plenty of Synergize... Plenty of synergize. We have plenty of synergies to work with it with all the other things that we're putting in here just to have extra artifacts sitting around to tap. So I think Sunshot Militia is beautiful. It's kind of exactly what you want out of two drop, where it's going to be fine turn two, but it gets around the issue where if you draw a two mana two two on turn seven or eight, you're going to be pretty unhappy with it. Militia stays relevant throughout the game, which is nice. And we just get every old tech cloud guard in the draft pod. And this is what I was saying about the Dynatomaton, which is like, while I like it, it's definitely weaker than the Cloud Guard. And if we're in a draft pod where we can get like three or four copies of Cloud Guard, then I guess we have to cut a Dynatomaton. Pick seven, another Atali's Favor versus Petrify again. I think we have enough removal. I'm not looking for another Petrify. We've got the Petrify, the Sunfire Torch, the Saw Blades. And the Rock Slide, so like four consistent removal spells, one idle if we need to play around with that. I think we have a good removal count here. I'm going to try the, the double favor. The fact that they can discover each other is also pretty cute, pretty cool. Oh, Captain Storm, we could have been the dream blue-red deck with all of our little uh, artifact creatures and treasure tokens hitting the board. Captain Storm can buff your board really quickly, but Tinker's Tote is still very good for this deck, so we'll take it. We could try to splash the Captain Storm off a treasure, but Tinker's Tote's good enough to not uh, not go for any splashes like that. Just take the Tinker's Tote. If there was nothing else on color, though, that might have been uh, worth it. Take the Captain and, and see if we can get the splashes going around. Ooh, very happy to take a Wanderglyph. And boom, now we got five two drops. Now our mana curve's getting pretty nice for an aggressive deck. This is looking very solid. Yeah, we've got 35 cards, so we're going to get to cut a lot of stuff. Actually, Acrobatic Leap's a fine combat trick. I'll put it in for now, but I don't think we're going to have room for any combat tricks. We'll see. We'll see in the end. You know what? There is something a little... Ooh, pick 13 Plundering Pirate. Well, goodbye all the envoys. We're just going to play a bunch of Plundering Pirates. Um... I was going to say, there's something a little sad about the Atali's favors for this deck in particular, which is that they're not artifacts to be tapped for our Sunborn or our Sunshot Militia. But that's only two of the cards in our deck, so we could still play around with them. I guess they can't be tapped for the Guardian of the Great Door either. So there's an argument to just cutting the Atali's favors and just running all the equipments instead. I don't know, we'll see. We'll see. We've got 38 cards so that puts us up to 55 non-lands here, or non-lands, 55 cards total for the deck. So we've got a lot of room to make some cuts here. All right, so let's check the creature to non-creature count, see about how much we want to cut of each. We probably want a little more aggressive of a deck here, so we definitely don't want to go lower than 15 creatures, but we probably want somewhere around 17, 18, really high creature count for this deck. We're currently at 22 creatures and two Tinker's Totes, which puts us up to like 24 creatures. So a lot of creatures to get cut out of here. First off, already said we'd be cutting the Envoy. 
just to run the pirates instead, because we also have these Tinker's Totes at three mana, so that's six three mana creatures still, which is still quite a lot, so we can cut the three envoys. At four mana, we have the three Cloud Guards and the Sunborn, which are all better than the Dynatomaton, while it is a good card. I think we cut it for those. Probably get pretty aggressive on the curve here, use a lot of equipment to juice up our smaller creatures to keep them relevant throughout the game, rather than having like one card that's just a big late game threat, we just buff up our smaller stuff to make them stay relevant, and our smaller cards can be our late game threats uh, via equipment and combat tricks and stuff, so I don't think this is really a Ceratops deck, let's get that curve lowered here. And that has us now at 17 creatures with two Tinker's Totes, which is like 19 creatures, basically. So we can still cut one or two more creatures if we want to. Um, and I'll keep the Guardian as the big finisher, because that can be cast for like three or four mana if we've got a bunch of permanents on board. So I think that's better than the, um, the Ceratops, since it has that mana reduction ability. Um, but yeah, let's cut probably our most dirtily two mana cards. At this point, like the Thousand Moons crack shot, it's really expensive and really narrow to use that tap effect. I think that's probably the worst one. Although we have cut every single dino out of the deck, so it is strictly better than the Burning Sun Cavalries. So I guess we cut the two Cavalries and leave in the one crack shot when we have zero dinosaurs in the deck. And yeah, I think that's the creature base here. Two totes. A saw blades that can turn into a vehicle so 2.5 more creatures sort of than it looks like so like 17.5 17 in a vehicle seems fine that means we get to cut eight non-creature cards here and at the end of the day while the atali's favor is cool i have played it a couple other times and it has been good i just feel like this might not be the deck for it this is not the kind of deck where we're going to have room for it because this deck can really use equipment well Equipment are really nice in this deck for a couple of reasons. One is that putting equipment on flyers is always great. So putting it on a guide wing, a cloud guard, a guardian, it's going to be awesome. If we get a torch, a pickaxe, a flail, one of these cards onto one of our flyers, we're going to be a very happy camper. So we've already got that going on with equipment, which, you know, auras get that same kind of synergy. Um, but our equipment can also be tapped for our cards that care about tapping an artifact or creature like our sunborn and our militia and our equipment our artifacts for our goblin tomb raider and maybe for our craft with artifact cards like spring loaded saw blades you know maybe i sack a torch end up with that in my graveyard and now i can craft my saw blades by exiling the torch from my grave so that's another reason our equipment probably play a little better than the auras so i'm gonna drop the favors although i do recommend them i have had decent experiences with them and it's a fun card and then we have a whole ton of combat tricks in a deck that's trying to also fit equipment in so i don't think we really have room for all of these combat tricks we might just not have room for any of them like yeah i have enough cards here i can cut every single one of these and still need to cut a card so yeah we could just drop the combat trick pile focus up on the equipment to buff our creatures and the hard removal with petrify saw blades rock slide and i guess i can drop the idol because it's the most narrow of our removal spells our sunfire torch can kill cards that are just as big as this for only two mana total instead of three yeah i mean the flipping this into the equipment's pretty inefficient and not that impactful, plus 2 plus 0 oh, for 2 mana to equip and 3 mana to play in the first place. I think I just prefer the torch for our little 2 damage removal, and I'll just keep the rock slide to kill big things. Then we have a rock slide, a saw blades, and a petrify to kill bigger creatures. 4 kind of pieces of removal total. Torch, petrify, saw blades, rock slide. It seems probably fine. Although I suppose what we could do here is cut a land and keep the idol. Which does also seem potentially reasonable. We have a pickaxe that might be able to spit out treasures. We have three pirates that'll make one treasure token. So I don't hate it. I don't hate cutting a 17th land. Average cost is 2.5. It's not, not terrible at all. But we do have some valuable 4 mana spells. 
I think I'm still happy to cut one land here, though. We'll try the idle out in the main deck for now. If it ends up being super bad, we can throw, like, a cavalry back in or something. But probably not going to adjust the deck at all in between rounds. That just is an option on Arena. Yeah, sure. I'll play an idle over a 17th land. So, how is red and white sources looking? Or red and white spells. We have 12 white spells, 14 red, so a tiny bit more red. Could just go even Steven. I need double white for the Guardian. Everything else in the deck is just one red mana or one white mana. Yeah, I think we can just go even 50-50 on this one. Uh, I mean, the one thing that's a little rough about that is that we have four one mana red spells and only one one mana white spell, so we do really consistently want a red source turn one. Plus, all of our treasure producers are red spells. You know what? I'm actually going to go 9 7. Because every single treasure producer in this deck requires red mana. So the red mana could hit our white mana. But the white mana can't do the same. There's no white card in this deck that could draw us a red source of mana. Except for in the really, really rare scenario where we play a guide wing and have another creature on board. And then the guide wing dies and that other creature explores and this digs me a little closer to a red source with the explorer ability. So that I'm not really going to count as a way for white to get a red mana, but the treasure tokens definitely help red get to our white mana. So we'll say red's more important and go 9-7 in red's favor. And then, yeah, we'll just call it a deck here. All right, here's a look at the completed deck list for today. We are on a red-white aggro deck with a really nice amount of synergies going for the kind of tapper sub-theme of the format. So the sub-theme of the red-white color pair is the kind of Kaparakti Sunborn ability here, where you want to tap two untapped artifacts and or creatures to get some extra value. So with the Sunborn, you'll be consistently discovering three, and with the Militia, you'll be dealing a bunch of damage to your opponent. We also have the Guardian of the Great Door, where you can tap a bunch of stuff to make this cheaper to cast. So with these kind of cards, we have tons of enablers for them, because anything that's going to spit out multiple cards or multiple permanents off of the one card is already just going to be a good spell up front. So we have like way more enablers than we have really payoffs, but that's okay because the enablers are good cards on their own. So we have three plundering pirates that are going to be a creature and an artifact, it's going to be the creature and a treasure token. Three Ultec cloud guards that are going to be a creature, uh, well, a flying creature and a 1-1 one -one gnome artifact creature at the same time off the one card. The tinker's totes are massive with tap effects because these are three permanents off of the one spell. We then have some equipment, which are great because we can equip them to our creatures give them the equipment bonus, and also tap them to whatever other effects while still retaining that extra plus two plus oh or whatever the equipment's going to be doing there, so that's super nice. Also, the Sunfire Torch has some craft synergies where we could sacrifice this to deal two damage to any target, and then we'll have an artifact in our graveyard that we can then use to flip something like our Spring Loaded Saw Blades or our Idol of the Deep King. And not only do these cards work well when we have an artifact in our graveyard or an artifact token on board to craft them with, but they work well with our tapper effects as well, because both of these are going to have a good little removal spell style enter the battlefield effect, and then just sit there being an additional permanent on our board to be tapped to our other effects. So a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Other than that, a great aggressive curve with a lot of removal and some equipment for our creatures to stay relevant throughout the game and one mega powerful bomb rare, a Neem Pakal, an army in a can just spits out more and more and more gnome tokens the more times you attack. Really, really powerful, really busted card, and overall looks like a really sweet, really powerful deck for today. So, fingers crossed, let's head into that gameplay and see how it does. And here we are now for game one. <laughs> it's tempting to keep here. But I think it's a little too risky. The monocolored opener with all off-color cards. 
The reason it's tempting, of course, is just the power level of the cards here, where we get to play our Bomb Rare into some Cloud Guards, but I think I have to mulligan this one. And this is a definite keep. This hand looks awesome. Okay. So we'll play the Guidewing turn one, then the Crack Shot, then play and equip a Pickaxe, ideally. I'll have to draw a land for that, but I don't think I ditch the Sunborn just to confirm the 1, 2, 3 curve. And I think I keep the pickaxe because it's going to be so good on three. See, I'll keep this and I'm going to ditch a land here. Hoping to draw a land in the next two draw steps. To be perfectly ideal. But we can still play the pickaxe next turn. And then it'll be ready to equip the turn after that. So there is that at least as a backup plan. We'll still be able to play the rest of our hand. It'll just be pretty slowly if we don't hit the land on curve. And if we do hit the land on curve, things are going to be beautiful here. Unfortunately, we drew the most expensive card in our deck. When we're stuck on mana, we drew our 6-drop. So that's awkward. I mean, I guess if I play Wanderglyph, we're one permanent away from just playing the Guardian. So I could do that instead of playing the Pickaxe. Is that greedy? I don't think so. Actually, let's go to combat. If they trade, we'll play the pickaxe. But if they don't trade, we'll play the wanderglyph. Okay, they are going to trade here. So we'll play the pickaxe. And it is a red-white mirror match. So they're on the same archetype as us. Or at least the same color pair. Alright. Pickaxe on the guide wing. Get our treasure. This would have been really bad if they had instant speed removal. Okay. They technically do still have instant speed removal, but it requires us to be attacking. Which is good for us, that means we still get the treasure. If they had like a braid where we wouldn't even get the treasure there, that would have been completely game ending. But luckily we have that treasure set up so that we play the Sunborn as soon as we hit one more mana. So there's a Sunscribe and a Dowsing device, so all their artifact creatures they play are going to hit the board with haste, thanks to that plus one plus zero haste trigger. So that's scary. We cannot draw lands. Alright, let's Wander Glyph it up. Putting one land on the bottom has not looked super hot here. Luckily, the Wander Glyph, if it sticks around, can draw us more cards. And if it just pulls out a 4-mana removal spell from our hand, that's trading up pretty well. I don't hate that. Perfect. Alright, that is actually beautiful. Because the Pirate gives us another treasure token. And if they're already... cool with... ditching 4-mana removal spells into our 2-2s... We might be able to get them to expend all their removal before we play a Sunborn or a Guardian of the Great Door, and then those cards just really take things over. There's their own Sunborn. If we don't find removal for that, that's going to be a complete disaster. Because then theirs gets to start discovering every turn first, which will be horrendous for me. It's honestly bad enough. I think I trade my Pirate here just to lower their permanent count. All right. Reverse curse. Right back at them. Hope they don't uh, discover removal or have removal in hand. And I could just play a 4-4 flyer, but I think I need to... I need to play my Sunborn so I can try to discover some removal here. And I have enough permanence to play the Guardian, even if I ditch the treasures to get the Wander Glyph down, so let's do that. Alright. They had another Rock Slide to kill our Sunborn, but we stopped theirs from doing anything yet. 
That is tremendously mega sad, though. Um... can hit for five, or I can just play the flyer. Let's just get the flyer down, I think. I can also discard the Tomb Raider to draw a card, but I don't think I want to do that. I think a 2-2 haste does actually look pretty good here. Maybe they just have like five rock slides in their deck. They're just going to rock slide again. Oh, lord. Well... Not working out super hot. Because now they discover every turn, and now the Sunborn just takes it here, probably. Dang. Just one for wanting us with a ton of removal spells is going to be very good anytime that we mulligan, because we're just naturally down a card already from mulliganing. So it's super easy to fall behind from there. And of course, Sunborn popping off means they're starting to get two for ones now. This has played two spells off of the one card. All right. I don't think there was a whole ton we could have done here outside of... I mean, maybe I could have kept the land, but even then I'm just getting everything I play. One for one rock slided, and then because I'm mulliganed, I'm behind from there. Maybe we could have mulled to five and we would have had removal for Sunborn or something, but... I don't think there was really anything that mattered too much gameplay-wise. We could have changed. Just not one that's in the cards for us. Yikes, there's another 2 for 1. Geological Appraiser, which is a 3-2, and it casts another spell off the Discover ability, which is a Sunfire Torch, so it discovered an artifact to give itself haste, and they have the mana to equip the double torch, so they could shoot us in the face for four if they want. We're dead if they do that. They can also just kill the Wanderglyph and we're dead. So many ways they find lethal here. Yeah. Alright. Well. Just some rough openers there. Not quite gonna get us there. Sunborn, as we saw from our opponent, the kind of card you need a removal spell or you lose. And we did not have our removal spells there, so... 0-1 to start things off. Heading into game two. Here we are now for game two. Definite keep here. The Wanderglyph can discard some high mana value spells to dig into lands. The Pirate can give us a treasure token from turn three. The Flail turns into a bomb once we have five mana. And speaking of bombs, there's a Neem Pakal as well. So we play that when we hit our third land now. There's a Malamet Brawler from our opponent. All right, so we ditch a four mana spell to draw a card. Whenever you attack with one or more non-gnomes. So I don't think we play this this turn. I think we want to play this on a turn that I'm going to be attacking with a non-gnome. So we actually just play the pirate first. Because if I play the tote, then all I have are gnomes, so that's bad. If I play the pirate, though, and they don't kill the pirate, then next turn I can cast our rare and immediately attack with a pirate and buff it up a little bit so it's out of range of two damage removal spells, like uh, Triumphant Tromp shoots for two, or the, um, the Torch also shoots for two, so it'd be out of range of all those things. So, yeah, let's drop a Neem... Play our land. We're going to get a gnome attacking. I'm not doing anything else with the one man. I might as well equip the pirate with the flail, but they're just going to block here. But I'm just not doing anything else with my last one mana anyway. I guess I could have kept it to put the flail onto the gnome. There's an argument for that, but I have the treasure left behind if I want to still do that next turn. If I don't hit a fifth land... So there's an axe draw. We would really like to get that out of the way before I declare any attacks with this. But if I do, I will spit out two more gnomes and I'll trade into the axe draw because of the flail. Could flip the flail and it's still one mana to equip. 
Hold up. If I flip the flail... It's one mana to equip it. So I can use my treasure to do that. And then I can sacrifice the gnome to do the ability and just get a bunch more gnomes because I attacked with a neem anyway. And I just shoot the axe draw? Oh my god. That's disgusting. Now even if they kill the rare, I still have a blunderbuss with some gnomes to sacrifice to it. If they kill a neem... Doesn't look like they're killing a Neem yet. And I can just sack a Gnome to kill the Dart Frog. So let's do that. Let's sack a non-attacking Gnome here. We'll get a non-attacking Gnome thanks to the Cloud Guard. That's 12 damage on board? Alright. That was not much of a game of magic. That was just two very powerful bomb rares working together in disgusting synergy there. One and one, heading into game number three. I think we just gave our opponent a phobia of garden gnomes. Here we are now for game three with that mana base coming in clutch again. That is... Probably a forced mulligan here. We're on the draw this time, but if I don't hit the red source, the hand's super bad. Yeah, it's a mulligan. All right, both colors. Militia, ditch a pirate, I think. Yeah, let's see what we draw from there, because this hand alone is not that much gas, but... The fact that we can cast most of it is very nice. Guidewing was a pretty good draw here. Um, kind of want to make sure I have a creature on board when this Guidewing dies no matter what, so I'm just going to drop Militia immediately. And that'll still hit for just as much as if I played and equipped the torch, since the Guidewing has Vigilance to work with Militia's ability. So we still hit for two, like if I would have played and equipped. There's Ever Flowing Well, so my opponent's on a slower, more grindy archetype, the blue-black Descend deck, which is great at filling its graveyard with permanence, and then a lot of its spells get a lot stronger once they have four or more, or eight or more permanence in Grave. So if we don't kill them quickly, we're going to be really scared later. So I guess I can just play and equip a torch here is probably my best line. Can't play any artifacts alongside the Tomb Raider. Really hoping to draw one more land so I can play and equip a pickaxe or just play a plundering pirate either way to get a treasure on this board. But Hey, we're jamming in for solid damage here. So can't complain too much. Getting a little sketched out here. I'm pretty sure we are running 16 lands. But it has not felt like it. We've been really, really low on mana here. 16 lands is only one less than 17. Like, 16 out of 40 versus 17 out of 40 doesn't change the odds of drawing lands that dramatically. But we have been very very low on mana in a few of these games so well a few of these hands we haven't played that many games but we have taken some mulligans so i don't know i'm a little sketched out i'm considering going back to 17 lands yeah statistically speaking shouldn't be that different from a 17 land deck here but we're just not hitting a lot of lands today all right, well, I can't attack into the mic wait on the ground. I guess I could petrify it so I can, but Militia's only poking for one anyway. 
So do I just set up the pickaxe for later? I think I set up the pickaxe, so even if I don't hit a land, I can get that going, and I will get to uh, ping with Militia twice here, since it's not going to be blocking. Now we have two other permanents. Alright. I mean, we put them down to ten off just our two lands, so maybe two lands is more than enough. My fingers are crossed. If we hit every land on curve, though, here, like, they would be under such immense pressure, there'd be, like, no way to recover. So this game would still be going way, way better with more lands. Skullcap Snail is so rude. Three mana next turn. <sighs> Can petrify the mycoid and cast a tomb raider, jam in for three. Probably the play. We probably ditch saw blades. I highly doubt they're gonna have many tapped creatures. The rate this game is going, they're just gonna hold up blocks forever. Wow. All right. Get double snailed. After a mulligan. Again. So monstrously far from ideal. Oh, they're actually going to attack with the mycoid. I guess we're not petrifying this turn then. Which means we equip a pickaxe. So I have a treasure for next turn to play the Cloud Guard. Actually probably should have put the pickaxe on the Tomb Raider, because now they could double block and kill the Tomb Raider if they want to. Yeah, I should have put it on Tomb Raider. But they just don't block, which is actually spicy. They don't kill the Sunshot Militia. That is very much threatening to kill them quickly. They can ping them three times next turn without even attacking, just by playing the Cloud Guard off the treasure token. The Great Mistake is terrifying. Now we have to be worried about them just, like, killing us on the crackback. I guess I can kill that with a Rock Slide? Rather than playing the Cloud Guard? Because they have 13 power on the board with that, and we're at 11. I can kill that with Rock Slide and still shoot them for 2, so that if they don't kill Militia next turn, they die. They have 7 damage on board? I guess I'd also just petrify it instead of rock slide. That's probably better. Hold up. I can actually torch their face and they just lose if I petrify that. Because so I can go. I can go petrify here. And then I can put the torch on the militia and attack with that. Shoot them for two. They're at three life. Then I have three untapped permanents. I guess I have one permanent off. No, I'll have four because I'll make a treasure. I guess I put them to one. I'm one damage off. In which case, I might as well torch a snail instead of the face. That should be the same amount of damage, and then they can't double block Tomb Raider. Yeah, they block one of these, take three, and then I shoot them for one. They go to one life. Maybe there was lethal here that I missed. 
Or no, I, I shoot for two. Okay, I would have hit for one more if I didn't send in Tomb Raider, but this way I kill both their snails. Yeah, instead of sending in Tomb Raider, I could have shot their face and then tapped Tomb Raider for the Sunshot Militia. So now if they kill the Militia, our game plan is obviously the, the Cloud Guard. Just jam in for three in the sky one time. So I think we're good. Most likely. They need two removal spells to stop us from killing them. Otherwise, we're just going to play a Cloud Guard next turn and then chump block the 4-3 with our Tomb Raider to survive long enough to kill them with the Flyer. Okay, really close game there. And a lot of that was because we just couldn't deploy our hand super fast. Like, if we hit every land on curve, we would have dumped things out so aggressively our opponent would have died several turns before they did there. So I'm kind of tempted to throw 17th land back in with how these games are playing. Like, even if our curve is really low, just consistently deploying all of our threats really fast, still super worth it. So, I mean, I guess it's not like I've drawn the Idol of the Deep King. So, technically, none of these games I would have drawn another land because I... That land would have been Idol of the Deep King, which we haven't seen a single time. But I think there's a good argument for still having 17 lands here with how things have played out. So I'm going to get another uh, White Source over the, over the Idol. Now we have 17 lands total. Heading into game something. The record is something something. I'll check after next round. All right. There we go. Add one more land, and boom, we've got a three land opener with a Wanderglyph to get out of any uh, flood. I play the Tomb Raider, then cast and equip the Torch. Or I can play the Torch and then cast the Tomb Raider and equip it. I don't think it really matters. I guess if I played the Tomb Raider, I could have played a Wanderglyph this turn to buff up instead of just going for the torch thing. Yeah, Tomb Raider turn one into Wanderglyph turn two was probably better. But this is still solid. It's going to stack up into like one less damage over the grand course of this game. Most likely. Ooh, that scout is incredible. Yeah, one mana, two, two. Look at the top card of your library. You can put it in your grave if you want. And they do put it in the graves. So they're probably looking for lands there because that's a quality spell. Okay, so now we are just going to cash in the torch to kill their two, two. Sadly. And then we're going to start ditching lands to the Wanderglyph. Look for some more spells at this point. Another scout. It's going to be another one mana 2-2. Two, two. No, this one is just going to be a one mana 1-1 one, one that draws a card, which is still an incredible card. But uh, less scary on this board. You know, we are in such an aggressive position here. Might petrify that just so they have no good blocks here. This is an aggressive early use of a petrify here but i'm gonna do it i don't really like this crack shot much but i do want to keep the next land so i can play another wander glyph and just do some major digging next turn i guess playing the crack shot since i'm almost out of spells in hand would guarantee i get to attack in next turn again even if they play like a, a four three or a five four blocker or something but if they play one of those, they can kill one of my Wanderglyphs and the other two creatures still get in, so I think we'll be fine. It's generally not the most efficient thing to dump your three man into crack shot, but that was one of the very few opportunities. Maybe it would have been fine. Maybe it would have been worth it. Cartographer's Companion is the play, which is a creature big enough to trade into one of our Wanderglyphs, but it doesn't like hold it off without dying. And I like that draw a lot. Probably keeping that. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's our win conditions right there. We're going to beat down in the sky. Mm 
Those were some very good draws. I guess double Wanderglyph being in this deck is another decent reason to have 17 lands, because we can get out a Mana Flood pretty easily with them. Getting out a Mana Screw with Wanderglyphs is a little harder to do. And that's because, like, if we're stuck on two mana... Then, alright, there's the concession. If we're stuck on two mana, then we're going to have issues even just getting, like, our two drop, two, two out, overplaying some other stuff, like our Tomb Raider and equipping and stuff. Like, we've seen in other games where we've gone for the other stuff before it. So maybe that's some self-imposed <laughs> mana screw there, where we could play the Wandering Glyph first. But we still have to resolve it and get an attack out with it and everything like that, so... All right, we are three and one now. Very solid position here. Going to get a 50-50 win rate no matter what, but I think this deck is sweet, and I'm hoping we can take it pretty far, if not all the way. So see how much farther we can take it as we head into round number five. Here we are for game five with our first hand that I'm a little scared is too high on mana. But we are playing with 17 lands now, so... That is the cutoff, really, isn't it? 16 lands, we're going to have too few a lot, and then 17 lands, we're going to have too many a lot. Oh, no. All right, we're going back to 16 lands after this. This is a bad start for us. We are flooding out. We need some good, cheap options to interact with their board. Otherwise, we're taking a million damage. To the point where I'm not even going to ping with Militia here, because if they play an artifact, I'd like to be able to stop two damage by blocking, rather than just deal one damage by not holding it up. They are blue-red, so they're more likely to have good uses of pirates like the Tomb Raider than dinos like the Yearling, and there you go, there's the pirate hat to buff up the whole board. And hitting this many lands is probably just killer in an aggressive matchup like this with our opponent on the play. Got a pickaxe here. I guess I can at least get this onto the board, but we're gonna put the flail onto the militia. Well, I guess either one we put onto the militia makes it big enough to uh, block and kill any of their creatures, and by choosing the pickaxe instead of the flail, it won't die if I try to trade it into the yearling, so... Yeah, Pickaxe was actually a, a very solid draw if they can't clear out our Militia here. But there's a lot of cards that could do it. There's Bounce Spells, there's Tap Spells, there's the Rumbling Rock Slide that we've played against a lot with that one red-white deck that we lost to. That'd be four damage if they play another land here. I suppose they can get a Pirate Hat on top of their creatures, give it plus one, plus one, and then if they put that on the Yearling, we won't have a good block. But that'll also cost two of their mana when they only have three lands on board, so it should be most of their turn to do that. Next turn, we can cast the Guardian of the Great Door. That is the one thing that is the plus side of having this many lands. Spend four mana on the Guardian and tap our Dire Flail and our Diamond Pickaxe to get it on the board. All right, they're going to go for the one mana equip onto a Tomb Raider. Send in a Tomb Raider and a Yearling. So they have some kind of trick to buff up and kill the Militia. I don't know what it would be that wouldn't also kill the Militia with the 2-2 two -two Tomb Raider. But I guess we'll see. I mean, I'm going to go for the kill. We still get to cast our 4-4 four -four next turn, even if Militia's not on this board. So it's got to be like plus 1, plus 1. If it's something that makes it so they can't attack with the 2-2 two -two here. That's a Braid. So they, they could have... I don't know why they didn't send the other Tomb Raider in. Kind of weird. Oh, they wanted to blow up the pickaxe, but it's indestructible. Maybe that's what it is. They wanted to... Um... Oh, I can't believe I'm getting punished for not have played the double white here. No! I was going to say I can play the guide wing and the 6-6 six, six in the same turn, but I need double white. So I would need three planes on board to do that. That's a big yikes. All right, well, we play the 4-4. Four, four. 
Anyways, I think they wanted to abrade the pickaxe, but then they realized it was indestructible, so that didn't work for them. They had to shoot the creature itself for the three damage. Uh-oh. Sunfire Torch? <laughs> Make the Tomb Raider 4 power? Yeah. Yeah. That's terrible. Play a Guidewing and have it be a two-toughness creature thanks to the pickaxe, but then... It just dies to the torch and the Tomb Raider gets in for damage, so... We have to just put a pickaxe on the Guardian and hope that that will then hold everything off. And we've got more mana, baby! No artifacts engraved to craft the Flail. So I need the pickaxe on the Guardian on blocks here. I'll put the Flail on the Guidewing, and if we get another turn, I can move the pickaxe to the Guidewing to declare an attack to get a treasure to help uh, craft the Flail, and then put the pickaxe back onto the Guardian for blocks. So we're setting up to flip our Flail into the Blunderbuss to try to shoot these goblins off the board. It's a careening minecart. They need another creature to crew that, but if they get one, they're going to have three attackers against two blockers, which will be rough. All right, they are going to torch the guide wing. I'd be a little surprised. They'd have to... Okay, yeah. I was going to say they'd have to spend two cards to do that. They sack the torch and the tomb raider, because Guardian is a, a free blocker on their tomb raider. All right, so we do our thing here. Well, I guess I could I could craft exiling the pickaxe, but then I wouldn't have any treasures. Yeah, no, we can't do that. Then I wouldn't have any treasures to shoot with the blunderbuss. We have to have extra treasures to sack or extra artifacts to sack. So we need to keep the pickaxe with the blunderbuss to get it really going here. Okay. Pickaxe goes back onto the Guardian. Then I play a mountain. And we pass the turn. And if I get another turn after this, I do have the mana to craft the Blunderbuss and put the pickaxe on the Guide Wing. Then I can order it to make the treasure pop out first and then sack the treasure to kill something. They have double Sunfire Torch now, though, thanks to the Geological Appraiser, which means they can shoot me in the face for four off of those things. So this, they might, yeah, I mean, they just crew the minecart attack with everybody, and then I just die to torches next turn. Dang it. Yeah, this, this hand just had way too many lands for their aggressive start. We got mildly close to stabilizing, which is cool, but... Big yikes. Oh yeah, I guess I'm already dead. Because they can just torch my blocker and I only block one thing. Really, wherever they threw the torch since they could attack with three creatures kills me. Alright. <laughs> and the icing on the cake is that we explored into another land after that. So, just can't win. 17 lands or 16. Arena is going to destroy us. We are 3 and 2 now. Heading into game 6. Here we are now for game number six. Our opponent is on the play. We don't start till turn three, but I think the hand's still really nice. And now we get to start on turn one with a Tomb Raider. Our opponent is mono white so far, starting things off with Vanguard of the Rose. I mean, offer the trade here. In normal circumstances, I would do that, but I want to make sure I definitely have the Tomb Raider on board for when I declare an attack, so that I can get my gnomes going immediately since I top-decked the rare. I 
Unfortunately, they've got one mana up, so they can make the Vanguard indestructible by sacking the Guide Wing, but that would still make them lose a creature. So we'll drop this down, attack with the Tomb Raider. It's going to attack as a 2-2. Two -two. And I'm going to spit out a 1-1 one -one tapped in attacking, which is actually good on this board state. Both their creatures are only one toughness. So we'll trade into something or deal a damage to them. Alright, so Tomb Raider is going to trade into the Guide Wing. That's a perfectly reasonable trade. Oh, maybe not. Maybe it's actually going to trade to the Vanguard. Oh no, I guess it's like a. they might as well stop the damage while they're doing it. Yeah, that's fair. They explore into their red source. No, they explored into the mana they needed to abrade here. That is an absolute tragedy. Against a 3-1, I like having a nice wide board of 1-1 one -one tokens. Gonna be pretty gross. You know, next turn I could play Pirate and Guardian. Could be pretty crazy. It's three mana. I get two more permanents on board. I play Planes as land for turn. I go white, white, one, two, three, four. Oh yeah, I can easily play Pirate and Guardian next turn. Well, that's a weird attack. If they spend a combat trick here or something... Plus two, plus two, trample. When it deals combat damage to a player, destroy target artifact that player controls. I mean, that's still not that bad for me. So they spend one Dreadmaw's Ire to deal with two 1-1s, one -ones, but the 1-1s one -ones are two-thirds of a Tinker's Tote. So I feel like that's still slightly in my favor. Like, they spent an entire card for most of my card. All right, now I'm not sure if I can Pirate plus Guardian, but I think I can, because I can tap these two. The Pirate and the Treasure. Well, never mind. Now my Treasure's hit the board tap. Random, perfect sideboard option. Hits the board and stops Tinker's Tote or Pirate from coming out the same turn I play Guardian, because now all my artifacts hit the board. Tapped. If I play Pun Plundering Pirate, I'll have double white and then one, two, three. Yeah, I literally, if the treasure came in untapped, could do it. The literal, actual, perfect card there. Yeah, so I can only cast one spell this turn no matter what. And I suppose we play our most impactful spell. Yeah, if it weren't for Dismantler, I had tons of options there. The best one's definitely being to play either of these and the Guardian in the same turn. But I also would have the option of playing the Pirate and cracking the treasure to play the Tote in the same turn as well. I'm not throwing the Guardian underneath the combat trick, but if they want a combat trick, my 1-1 one -one Gnome away, that is cool. Whoa. My 1-1 one, one Gnome gets to trade up into a 1-4? That seems good. Alright, well, solid work from the 1-1 one, one Gnome. Solid, solid work there. And we are flooding a lot again. I'm gonna drop back down to 16 after this game. I'm just gonna keep going back and forth. And we're going to get mana screwed on every 16 game and flooded on every 17. 
such as the way of life. I'm not going to sack any totes until I absolutely need to, because we have so much mana here. We're not going to be stuck off the mana uh, to gain the life, most likely. Um, and I do have a couple cards I could draw into, like Sunshot Militias, that it would be very valuable to have these still around for. There's a 4-5 reach against my 4-4 flyer, and that completely stops our attacks. Unless I top deck Dire Flail. And Dire Flail is another incredible way to use these totes. Alright, so we're doing it. I do have to crack the treasure to insta-flip, but insta-flipping is pretty important here. So I'm going to... Do I have an artifact and grave right now? No. So let's... Well, will I still have the mana to equip? Red, red, one, two, three, one to equip? Yeah, I will. So let's gain the three then, and then craft a tote that's in our graveyard. Because we might as well, if I'm about to craft a tote anyway, which I am. Slap the blunderbuss onto the guardian. We're hitting for seven in the sky and shooting the reach blocker when we attack. All right. They're down to eight. And even if the guardian dies, this blunderbuss is looking sweet with a couple more one ones to throw around. 16 life, I'm just going to take this. So if the Guardian dies, I still have threatening counterattacks here. Well. Probably should have moved the Blunderbuss. But it's definitely an attack all. I should have put it on one of the 1-1s, one so I'd be attacking with a 3-1, a 3-1, and a 4-4. Four, four. A 3-2, a 3-1, and a 4-4. Four, four. Actually, I don't even think I sack a 1-1 one, one now. Yeah, they're going to cause me and blast it. This is definitely worse. We could have hit for four damage if we had this on one of our 1-1s one -one still. Yeah, it looks like my 3-2 is trading into a 3-2. Perfectly reasonable. Oh, it's plus three. We would have hit for four more damage. No, it still would have been three more damage. So they'd be down to three life. There's a Curator of Sun's Creation. See if they have a two mana discover spell to follow it up. Nope, they are going to attack with a Vanguard, which is real bold. See what the last spell is then. Dusk Rose Reliquary to exile the Blunderbuss. Shoot. Now it's a top deck war. And we got a really good start. I guess it is a top deck war where we're favored, because we have four more life than our opponent, and we get the first draw of the top deck war. So let's see. Do they find insta removal for Sunborn? If they don't, we probably win. Although I guess even if they just find another blocker, they get to immediately double block, kill the Sunborn here. Looks like we get to discover... Find a Plundering Pirate, which is a big one. They take the damage, they just have nothing. Here's our crack shot. We actually do have plenty of mana to tap things down. Send in the 3-3, three, three, block with the 3-2. And there's the concession. All right. 
solid luck in that end game. It did all come down to a top deck war, and we won that pretty quickly. So some good luck on the final flips, but a little bit sketchy stuff in that early game. Lots of lands early again, so... I mean, our first two losses, our first one was just really getting stuck on mana with our 16 land version of our deck, and our second loss was just really flooding out with our 17 land version of the deck. And that was another game where the amount of mana drawn was getting real sketchy. But we've also had a lot of games where the amount of mana drawn in the early game has been sketchy, where we've been stuck on like two mana, so I... I really just don't know where this deck lands. It just feels like the draws are going to be a little spooky either way, a little sketchy either way, so. Yeah, I mean, maybe we could just put in the Ancestor's Aid over the 17th land. That way, our... Um, that way, our 24th non-land card is another way to get a little bit of mana off a treasure token. But it still is a more relevant draw during top deck wars like that, where then we could attack with the gnomes and then I could have used that first strike trick to win the fight against the 3-3. I don't know. Maybe that balances it out right in the middle. We'll see, because we drew it here. So would this be better if it was just a third land? In an opening hand, yes. But we'll see how the game plays out. The hand's a definite keeper either way. Oh, <laughs> drawn to a Neem. Might convince me to just Ancestor's Aid turn two just to get a treasure. But I can also Wander Glyph to try to draw the third land. Discard the Ancestor's Aid or the Rumbling Rock Slide because that's a four mana spell. It's a River Herald Scout. All right, well, I will definitely go for an Ancestor's Aid then. Because now we could also kill the scout, which would be pretty sweet. Actually get to use this as a combat trick plus treasure, like intended. Alright, Diamond Pixaxe is the draw. Well, that's not what I wanted to see at all. If I were my opponent, I would have 100% blocked there, because I think you're happy to trade your 2-3 into any combat trick. Uh, Wander Glyph it is, I guess. Because if I Ancestor's Aid now, then when I play a Neem, I'm tapped out and just showing my opponent that I'm Trump attacking with the Tomb Raider. And if they play any creature, I'm Trump attacking with the Tomb Raider and the 1-1 one -one Gnome. She's not even going to be that great next turn. Oh, they're going to final strike at sorcery speed while I'm tapped out, which is fair. All right, excellent draw. We just hit the land naturally and go to town. This is a game where it looks like land would have been better than Ancestor's Aid because we wouldn't have had to worry at all here if we had a third land. We would have just known we could, we could hit an Eam turn three. Ooh, Kaparakti Sunborn? Yeah, then we could have just played the Sunborn this turn and things would be really mega ultra gross. Things are already pretty disgusting. So this gets me the treasure to drop Sunborn next turn. Playing the Pirate would as well, but... I might as well keep the uh, the threats that I currently have on board rather than dumping another one here. All right, there's the concession. Incredible Bomb Rare wins another game. They did not have the cheap removal. Well, they did. They just spent it on something else. So we are 5-2, and two, heading into round number 7. Gonna stick to the 16 land Ancestor's Aid version of the deck, and that'll just be a mind game we play every time. 
we'll just keep looking at the Ancestors aid and being like, would this have been better if it was a land? That game, yes. That game is a yes. So one point towards the 17 land build, <laughs> but we'll see. We are now in the money no matter what at five wins. We're getting more gems than it costs to play the event, so we're super happy whatever happens from here. But would love to see us get a seven win run today. So let's see if we can keep it up heading into game eight. All right, land would be way worse than Ancestors 8 in this hand. Way, way, way worse. Yeah, this hand would be unkeepable if it was a five lander. Here it's close. I think it is a keep though. Militia into tote is not a terrible start. We just are hoping to draw non-lands, obviously. Maybe we'll still flat out with the uh, the 16 land build here. It's possible. Like, if you keep... If you're playing a 16 card deck and you, just for RNG reasons, like, draw a... Um, hold up. This, this Vanguard's annoying enough because it can keep getting the indestructible that I might just torch it instead of playing the tote. I don't know, I don't have to attack into it at all, and just having gnomes stops that from attacking, so I'm not going to torch it. Anyways, even if you're playing, like, even a 15 land deck, if your opening hand is like 6 lands and 1 spell, you're still probably going to flood out, so... Shouldn't always think uh, of the statistics that way. Because if you're starting with more lands than you need already, to where any land you draw is flooding, it doesn't matter that you're only going to draw two or three more lands throughout that game. That's still flood. All right. Yeah, just keep on curving. Here's the cloud guard. And I'm not going to be blocking with the flyer. So let's just keep the 1-1s one -ones up against the 3-1. Trade a 1-1 one -one gnome into a map token here, I think. No. Ah, they had a non-land on top. So they do get to buff the vanguard to 4-2 stats, so I have to trade two gnomes into it. So I would rather not trade two gnomes for one Cartographer's Companion, so I'm not going to make the block here. We'll go down to 16. There's a Clay-Fired Bricks? That's not another creature. Maybe we just get to attack with all the gnomes this turn. It looks like we do. Ooh, Keparakti Sunborn? Kind of wanted to play a Torch or a Tote or an Aid or something, but I think we just play the Sunborn, and now they have to dump removal on that. Yeah, we just take all the crackbacks here. Let's send in with everybody, play the Sunborn, tap it in the tote. To the Militia. Take six damage on the crackback if they don't buff things up, and they can't flip this to give everything plus one, plus one until they have seven mana. All right, they're going to trade their 2-1 into a 1-1 one, one to stop some damage, which is fair enough. Here's our Sunborn, which is not going to be blocking, so we'll tap it to shoot them. Militia's just getting in damage. To be fair, if the Militia was just a 3-1, it would also be getting in damage. Although I guess no, it would have just traded into the Companion. Yeah, Militia is playing well. Yeah, now they have to hold up on blocks. And we can try to torch their Vanguard of the Rose. I guess they can just sack the bricks if I try to do that. Oh no, they're going to counter our torch to discover one? Let's see their one mana spell in their deck, I guess. It's a landmark, Scry 2. All right. Cute. Well, now they're tapped out of giving the Vanguard indestructibility, so we can Ancestors aid it. So we attack all but one here.
Yep. Um, so I have two things to discover with. And then I can still have the aid mana up. To cast a Tomb Raider. Now we aid to save the Sunborn, because that can't get indestructible. And there's the concession from our opponent. We are now 6 and 2. That time finally really showing off the power of the Sunborn, but I guess we saw the power early because we got destroyed by it. We had that matchup where our opponent had the removal for ours, we didn't have the removal for theirs, and they got to pop off with the Sunborn. Yeah, card is nuts. We are 6-2 and two now, heading into the final boss. No matter what, this is going to be the final game of Magic for the day. The difference between a 6 win so close to greatness run or the seven win max prizes max payout run fingers crossed here as we head into that final battle all right here we are for the final boss with this hand we can play a wanderglyph into a pirate the pirate makes sure we have at least one white mana and the wanderglyph can ditch extra white spells to dig for planes Gonna keep the hand, but it's definitely not ideal. Our opponent starts with a tapped hidden necropolis, so probably a slower deck here. And here's another game where the Ancestor's Aid would have been better as just another planes, it looks like. So it does look like they're a slower deck here, which is nice. Um, so we can attack with Wanderglyph, ditch the giant expensive double white card. We probably actually ditch Sawblades. I don't think we're killing a tapped creature anytime soon. But if I can get a treasure token in one planes, Guardian could come out at some point this game. Find another mountain. Next turn we're ditching a mountain to the Wanderglyph. For sure. Looking for the white source for the Guardian. I guess I could spend two treasure tokens, because I have the Ancestor's Aid. There's a Stinging Cave Crawler. We can Ancestor's Aid to win the fight against that. Or we can Rock Slide it post-combat, I suppose. Find a Cloud Guard. Another white spell, not a Plains. Strong enough card, though. I might just cast that post-combat here to keep the pressure up. And I think I will. Now we're probably discarding Guardian. On our next attack. Oh, no. I feel like our deck is strong enough to beat a Malicious Eclipse with a good hand, where our mana's not having issues. I don't think we can beat Malicious Eclipse off the monocolored opener. Oh my god, we've done so much digging arena, please. Now I'm far enough behind in card advantage, I kind of need to keep, like, the strongest, spiciest cards, I think. I'm gonna ditch the crack shot to keep the Guardian here, because again, aid and then a planes gets there. Just can't find it. Even if they kill the Wanderglyph, if we top deck a Plains, we go double white off the treasure in the Plains, and then the four mana is the three mountains and the pickaxe. So we've got a 4-4 flyer to try to close things out if we find a single white land this game. And we can petrify that great mistake no matter what, thanks to our treasure token. I think it's better to petrify that than to rock slide it since it can come back from the grave later. I guess it'll take a really long time to come back from the grave. Now, in order to keep hitting white mana, we need to 
Keep getting treasures off the pickaxe. If I attack with Wanderglyph, it's going to trade into an Echo here, which is pretty terrible. Unless I could cast Petrify and Rock Slide in the same turn, which I can't do. Let's see what we get. All right. Well, that was a punt attack. I didn't mean to attack that way, but once I declared the attack, I'm like, well, this isn't that bad of an attack because there's no way they'd block with the great mistake anyway when they just have the echo on board. It really doesn't matter at this point now, though. Well, I mean, the difference between... Petrifying pre-combat and getting the echo off the board and them still having an echo is not that massive. We're losing the game either way. They would just have an empty board, so we're not actively taking damage right now. But either way, Wanderglyph goes to the graveyard this turn. And we don't get to discard any more to draw any more after that. But that was a punt. I meant to petrify pre-combat, but I just clicked into the attacks too fast. Clicked into the combat step too fast, and once I was there, I was like, well, we need to draw the card, so. Yeah. Maybe. Taking four damage a turn. don't think with a death toucher on their board that sunborn's the way to go we drop the cloud guard and try to get a pickaxe onto it Are they going to play a Tithing Blade to make us sack a creature here? I don't know. If that's their follow-up play, this is going to be rough, but there's so many other things it could just be. They just deadweight the Cloud Guard or whatever. But they'd rather save the deadweight and trade a creature off. So they might as well attack first and then go for the deadweight on the Cloud Guard. Yeah, there's so many just regular removal spells this could be. I, I don't think I play around the Blade. Sure, if it's the blade, it's bad, but it's not that much worse. Because I think they would play that way with literally any other removal spell, any targeted removal, because they would still rather trade off their creatures than the targeted removal so they can save the targeted removal for scarier threats later. Defossilize a cave crawler. Hit another defossilize. Alright. The blue-black deck is one of those grindy late game kind of decks that you need to just aggro out really well to kill. And we could have if they didn't have the Eclipse. Um, or if we just had both our colors of mana. I think we could have gotten through the Eclipse with perfect mana. But today has not been a day of perfect mana. I will tell you that much. All right, just get the cave crawler back again. We have one more turn. That Didact Echo damage has stacked up. If we did do the pre-combat petrify and then get the uh, pickaxe swing in to where they didn't have this Echo hitting us, would have had three, maybe four more turns. So obviously this was 
played pretty poorly. That being the one really bad punt. There were other plays that didn't work out perfectly for us, like not playing around Tithing Blade, but I don't think that's objectively bad, because again, any removal in the world, they would have made the same play, so I don't think we can make a much worse play against any other card, just because it's the better play against this one. And now we're dead no matter what. So, alright. Maybe... Maybe. It's a real long shot, but if we had a few more turns by not having taken any Didact Echo damage, maybe we could have had a shot in that game. Tried to very slowly turn things around. But generally speaking, Blue-Black is going to have a much, much better time in the late game than Red-White from the get-go. So I think it would have been pretty unlikely. Uh, again, there were some other lines that weren't ideal, but I think there was only one real punt here, which was just a silly misclick thing where I clicked to combat, and at that point it's like, well, I still go for the attack. And then they did not take the bluff. They killed the Wander Glyph for free instead of losing the Didact Echo, so we died a few turns early. Whereas here, we hit the planes on time to where if we didn't take any Didact Echo damage... Probably be at like 10 life here, and then we play a Cloud Guard, which is something. Wouldn't have the mana to play it and put a Pickaxe onto it, but we'd have a Cloud Guard, which would then trade there, and the 1-1 trades into the Snail. Yeah, holds off the current board state. And they start draining us out with Tithing Blade. They're up in cards where they have two more in hand still, and a Cave to discover with. Would have been a long shot, but could have had a chance here. Just a dumb human error brain kind of punt of just clicking too fast. I don't think it was a punt really in terms of thinking through the game incorrectly, in terms of what I should have been doing, in terms of when I want to attack or block or anything like that. The punt was just that I went to combat without casting Petrify because I clicked the OK button instead of my hand. It was just a brain fart punt. But maybe, maybe at that point, once we went to combat, we should have just been like, oh shoot, I punted out of the, getting the attack this turn and just petrified post-combat without attacking. But I think we still had to attack with Wanderglyph there. We'd get a treasure token and a card draw off of it, which was pretty important, even if it ends up trading into the 3-2. So, yeah. That was the moment of the game, the play of the game, but even without it, drew really bad mana-wise, and it would have been a hard, hard battle for the final game. Well, 6-3 is a pretty phenomenal record with a ton of prizes, so it is rough to feel this bad about it, because I feel like this deck could have easily gotten a 7-win run, but to a certain extent, all three of our losses, we hit some really rough draws mana-wise. We played around with a 17 land deck for a while and flooded a lot. Played around with a 16, got mana screwed a lot. Those last few games, Ancestor's Aid looked like it always would have been better as a Plains, so maybe I should have kept with the 17 land deck, but you never know what's going to happen there, because with the way that the Shuffler works, with the... Um, with it picking the better hand out of two in terms of land to non-land ratio. With a 17 land deck, it's entirely possible that we would have gotten completely different hands these last three games because the shuffler would have shuffled into the hand that had the Ancestor's Aid in it, and that would have had a Plains in the hand instead, which means that the land count would have been different, so the shuffler might have picked the other hand instead of the one that we currently had, so we don't even know if <laughs> if the Ancestor's Aid was a Plains instead, if we would have drawn the same hand, except with a Plains instead of Ancestor's Aid, because Magic Arena is kind of weird like that in Best of One, so who knows. The one thing that is for certain is that we have had some mana issues today, and I think that was the primary thing 
keeping this deck from a seven win run, which is pretty disappointing because I think this deck was pretty busted. It does have a couple flaws. Our removal is pretty expensive rather than the much more efficient removal of like a two mana abrade instead of this rock slide. Our curve isn't perfect. We could use a couple more good two drops instead of the really mediocre Thousand Moons crack shot. If we had like two more wander glyphs instead of this crack shot and maybe one of the cloud guards, this would get like as close to perfect as possible. But I think the deck is still really powerful. It still has really explosive plays and it played very well despite having some mana issues. Even a lot of the victories we had today, we had plenty of mana issues to go around. So Shuffler trying pretty hard to keep us down, but still getting a 6-3 run. Not a bad end to the day at 1,800 gems and five packs as the prizes. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and you're interested in seeing more, you can like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more on your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.